welcome to the Filmed Live Musicals podcast, a podcast about stage musicals that have been legally filmed and publicly distributed. The Filmed Live Musicals website contains information on nearly 200 musicals that have been captured live. Check it out at filmedlivemusicals.com. And now, on with the show. Welcome to episode 51 of the Filmed Live Musicals podcast. I'm your host, Louisa Lyons. Before there was Book of Mormon, there was a very merry unauthorized children's pageant, a musical with book, music, and lyrics by Kyle Jarrow based on a concept by Alex Timbers, who also directed the original production. The musical satirizes Scientology and its founder, L. Ron Hubbard, and is billed as a one-act dark musical comedy that links the relationship between pageantry, children's theater, and cults. My guest today is Sean Pollock, director, executive producer, and designer of the upcoming filmed live production of A Very Merry Unauthorized Children's Pageant. Welcome, Sean. Hi, thank you. So I've read that you were a child actor in The New Kid and French, and you were a camper at Frenchwoods. What made you fall in love with theater? That's such a good question. And I always wish I had a more exciting story about this because I feel like there's a lot of people who like come out of the womb and they're like, they're like ready. Like they are like, so like, this is what I want to do. And I, I did start really young for sure, but I, I just grew up in a town. I grew up in mountain lakes, New Jersey, which is a very small suburban town. And it was kind of like you either did sports or like you did chorus, I guess. And I was always really bad at sports. I was, like, terrible at them. So I just gravitated towards anything anything creative. And sometime in about fifth grade, I auditioned for the school play that we did. And then I, I guess I just never stopped. I was like, I, I like this enough. And, uh, and then I, I just kind of kept doing it. And neither of my parents are, like, like theater people, creative people. Like, my mom was, like, an HTML um web programmer and my dad was in sales he had like a lot of different sales jobs so I did not come from a like gypsy rose lee type situation or like a showbiz family at all they could not have been caught more off guard by this I mean truly no one in my family in my media family has like a a showbiz bone in their body my dad played guitar but he doesn't even sing you know what i'm saying like it's like (laughs) it's one of those situations however however my on my dad's side my aunt was a rocket and my cousin blair was on the cosby show yeah other than that like not really a showbiz family although the rocket thing is is funny um and I can say more on that or not, but yeah. Oh, sure. Go ahead. I, I'd love to hear the story. <laughs> well, so what I always think is so interesting about this story is that my Aunt Linda was a rockette in the 70s, and she was a rockette during the Radio City um, Easter show that they used to have. And the, exactly, the face you're making is the reaction <laughs> I get from so many people because I didn't even know that was like a thing. But apparently they used to do an Easter show. And if you Google it, there's this great picture that I love, love, love. Actually, I don't think my aunt is in it. But it's a bunch of, um, it's like a black and white photo from like the 50s or something of all the Rockettes sitting in Radio City Music Hall with these giant fuzzy bunny ears. I really would have loved to have seen it. It, it looked really weird, um, but they like dis- <laughs> they discontinued it. I think probably because it's kind of bizarre. But basically, for reasons that I don't fully comprehend, the Rocket Company, whatever the GMs, I guess, told her she wasn't tall enough to be in the Christmas show. But she was. Oh. Yeah, I know, but she was devastating. I know, tall enough I, for Easter, not tall enough for Christmas. I know, I know. I'm like that seems. I don't understand that logic. So then, how did you become a child actor? It's such a exa- exactly. It's, it's a great question. Um, I guess so. Okay, so I did that school play. I feel like that's. I mean, I think I took an acting class maybe in like fourth grade or something like that. But I feel like that was the first real thing that I did and then god I mean it was so long ago so I'm trying to remember but I think it was it was sometime after that that I auditioned for 
that show, The New Kid. So The New Kid was um, a show that was all kids, and he used to tour at different schools. Um, and then I, I went off Broadway with it in 2007 at the York Theater, um, which I always say like 10 people and my parents saw, which like is probably honestly not far from the truth. I mean, we, I remember we did the show for about two months or so, but it was only on Saturdays. And I think now that I've done very merry, I, I now under, I really, I mean, I knew, but now I really understand like when you're working on a show with all kids, like at a certain level, like there's such uh, strict parameters with how often you can use them. And I think Paul, the guy who created that show was really trying to not pay a whole lot of money to, you know, do a lot of shows. And like, again, cause it was all kids. So I think if he added more shows, he would have, had to basically double cast it. And what how that show was done, so like I said, so we toured it, and it was a really fascinating experience because I was really green. I remember I sung the song Teacher's Pet from the Disney movie, um, but I think it's also a song outside of the Disney movie. It's like, Teacher's Pet, I want to be Teacher's Pet. I remember I, I sung that song. It was like the first song I learned in voice lessons. And... I, I guess I just did a good enough job or they needed boys either or and my and Paul like just like offered like for me to be a part of the troop on the spot and my mom was like okay um and and my mom really had no interest in being a part of like that that stage mom kind of persona like she was always like super chill about it and other kids and the new kids their parents were like pretty intense and I have friends who would go on a lot of auditions for Broadway and like TV and film and stuff like that and my mom wouldn't let me do it I mean I don't think at the time people were um really looking to audition me seriously because by the time I I started really I think I had was 10 turning 11 and that's actually kind of old and in child biz world believe it or not because they really a lot of agents and managers want their clients to start really young um because if they're if they're good at you know what they do by the time they reach 11 12 13 if they can still believably play younger they already have that experience under their belt um and that's that's kind of what everyone wants but even even if I like was getting these auditions, I don't know if my mom would have really wanted me to do it. I think my, I do remember my mom wanting me to really feel like I had a normal childhood and joke is on jokes on her because I, I didn't, but for, for a lot of, for a lot of other reasons, but I think it's important to note too, that like, you know, so I just turned 30 and which is not old, but at at certain times I, I look at the industry and I think about how much has stayed the same and how much has changed since I came up in it. And the reality is when I was that age, as opposed to when I was four, yeah, when I was like 13, 14, like when I actually made my debut in The New Kid, I had lost a lot of weight, but I was, I was a heavier kid and I... I don't, I don't, again, I think it was, it kind of worked out because my mom didn't really want me to like super blow up in any kind of way, but I don't think the industry really was like, yeah, like let's put a fat kid in things. Like I, I look back on a lot of, a lot of media from that period of time, especially stuff that deals with kids. And I do not mean this in an affront to Alex Timbers at all, but even the original Very Mary is like super white, thin kids you know, which I think now that I'm in the director producer chair, and especially when I, I work with kids, diversity in all forms is really important to me. And, and as a person of size, I do think um, that biodiversity is, is really, really important. So anyway, so I did the new kid um, again, like it was, it was kind of a short run and it was only on Saturdays. But what I will say, though, is that even the community theater that I did, because I grew up like an hour outside of New York, and everyone that directed me in community theater, like, 
took theater really seriously. And I remember I would do shows locally with people who like had done professional shows and just didn't want to keep doing it anymore for whatever reason. And so they would just do community theater, but I, it was like, I can think of so many times where it was like a really, really intense environment. Like it was very, very high stakes. Um, and, and I was trained by this one woman named Caroline Worth Tyrell, who she's dead now. So I feel cool talking about how she actually was. And she was like a tyrant. She was hardcore. And she would like actually scream at us like a lot. Mm. But I do remember I was in the pajama game and I broke my ankle. And I was on crutches for a really long time. And I, I actually broke my ankle so badly it fractured my growth plate and I had to have like two different surgeries on it it was really intense and I remember like I had this surgery and I and then I was and then I was fine and because they had to put a screw in they had to put it like a screw in my ankle and then a few months later they had to take the screw out and then when they took the screw out my body had to adjust to that for a few months so I think there was about I actually think when I auditioned for the new kid I was on crutches now that I think about it which maybe swayed Paul's decision maybe he was like this poor fat kid on crutches cannot catch a break I need to cast him um and but I do remember like I I that fall I I was off crutches and then in the winter when I had to get the thing removed, I had to be on crutches again for like two months or something. And I remember like Caroline was like, when are you going to be off those crutches? She was so mad at me and being like, I told you I didn't want those crutches on my stage. And like, I, like acting like this production of the pajama game with all children was like going to Broadway. And I had done at that point two other shows with her. And I remember being like, I love being on stage and making people laugh and whatever and all the fun stuff. But I really hated the way that she treated us. Um, and I remember being ha having this sense. I was like, this like isn't normal. Like I shouldn't be going to this thing that I otherwise enjoy where this woman is like making me feel bad about myself. I want to pause you there because we're, I, I want to get to, um, get to the show that we're here to yes. talk about. Yes. So speaking of um, people treating children terribly, <laughs> yeah. let's talk about Scientology. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's how, a good segue. <laughs> how did you first get involved with the show? A very merry unauthorized children's Scientology pageant. So um, in 2008, I directed a non-musical version of Carrie. Not to be confused with Carrie the Musical, which I did direct the first licensed college production of almost 10 years ago. So put that on my tombstone. I am actually very proud that I did that. But anyway, when I was a teenager, I did my own version of Carrie. And um, there was a girl who was in it named Allie Klein. And Allie um, was the original angel mm -hmm. in, in the very first production of Very Mary in 2003, 2004. Um, and I just remember, like, that title in her bio. And I just, it's not, it's just not a title you really forget. And then when I was in college, that documentary Going Clear came out um, on HBO, the, like, anti-Scientology documentary. And I knew some stuff about Scientology, but I remember watching that documentary and just being so blown away as to how this really terrible cult um, is still, like, a thing at all. Like, I still, I mean, I understand it on, on the level that the IRS has them protected as a religion, and that's why they're still allowed to get away with literally murder, but... Um, but I do remember just being like, this is so actually insane. And I remember I was like, wasn't there like a musical about this? And I, and I, I like Googled, I was like Scientology musical and I found it. I found very merry. I found the record, the, the original cast album. Um, and I remember listening to it and just thinking it was hilarious and, and like weird and, and so not like any other musical that I knew. And I, I, and I still ascertain that like there is really no other show 
that I can think to compare Very Mary to, because earlier you said Book of Mormon, and people have said that to me a lot. They're like, oh, like Book of Mormon. But what is really important to remember about Very Mary is, again, when it was first done, um, Scientologists are so famously litigious, and I know that, like, lawyers showed up at rehearsals and stuff like that, and and Kyle and Alex kind of went through the ringer a little bit. Um but I think I think it was exciting for them in a weird way. But I think it like was parents of the past were like <coughs> threatened and yeah, yeah, yeah. In this industry again. <laughs> yeah, well, that I think that happened when it went to LA. I don't know if that happened in the New York run of it at all. But all of this was to, is to say, like, yeah, there's just there's not a show like it, and um, uh, I I just really was like. I want to do this. I, I, and by, remember, I'd only ever listened to it. So I'd never seen it staged. Um, and ironically, so I went to Ithaca College. Kyle is from Ithaca. And actually, while I was at Ithaca, that's kind of when I wanted to do it because I used to run my own horror and science fiction theater company at Ithaca called Macabre Theater Ensemble that's still running, actually. Um, it's just, it's turning 11 this year, which makes you feel really old. But, um, but I remember wanting to do it then, but it, again, the show is all kids and I was a college student and I remember I did assassins in college and it was like hard enough to find that one kid for, um, like I think his name was Billy or something. And I, I couldn't, I actually literally couldn't even find this kid and we had to cut it. Um, so very Mary was not in the cards for me in college. And I think it was just like an idea I always wanted to do. And then a few years later, um, at 54 Below, I saw um, Rachel Lily Rosenblum and Don't You Ever Forget It in concert, which was so amazing. Bonnie Milligan, Catherine Allison. Um, oh my God. So many, so many really, really great people were in that concert. And I remember just being like, I have to do something here. And I set up a meeting with Natalie Walker, and I actually, oh my god, I said Natalie Walker. Wow, my brain is leaking out of my ears. Natalie Walker was a cast member in the show. I don't know why I said that. I meant Jennifer Ashley Tepper. Jennifer Ashley Tepper is the one uh, who runs programming at Fifty Four Below. Um, and is an amazing theater historian uh, as well. She is. She she really knows her stuff. And at the time, I. Um, I pitched either doing Very Mary or Lestat. Do you know Lestat? <laughs> I have. I don't know it, but I know of it. Okay. I so that was literally the first musical I ever directed when I was in North Carolina. I did like an illegal adaptation of Lestat, and I've actually I've since in in this combo with him before. I actually did get to meet Rob Roth, the original director of Lestat, and like talk through it and that was real that was a really cool experience because really actually 54 below i feel like that whole thing really opened a lot of doors for me because i was pursuing i pursued lissat and and rob roth kind of was just like yeah you're not gonna get the rights to that and i was like okay but he did meet with me and he was very kind and um gave me a lot of really interesting tea about that show if listeners if you don't know it i encourage you to look it up um the the new interview with the vampire just came out on AMC. It's fantastic. It's based on the Vampire Chronicles books, and it's a musical by Elton John about gay vampires in the 2000s. Really, really a dark horse for its time. Um, not a perfect show, but a show that I love very much, and it always will be because it was the first musical I ever directed. Um, but the rights for Very Mary were, were available, and um, and Jennifer was like... Uh, uh, what I what I can do is there's a guy named Van Dean. Um, Van Dean runs Broadway Records, and he um, at the time when I did it, it was a little serendipitous because he had just produced Your Good Man Charlie Brown off Broadway with all kids um, at the York of all places. It just comes uh-huh. full full, full circle. circle. <laughs> um, and uh, and Jennifer was like, he might be willing to help you out, and basically Van was like, yeah, I mean, if you use my name, you can go to any talent agency and get, like, whatever kids you want. And to be honest, like, I I know it sounds like I'm probably making this up, but I really didn't... it, It didn't occur to me at the time 
that that was even a possibility. Like I just wanted to do the show. I mean, I was 24. I had been directing for a while. Like I said, I mean, I started my first play return to Oz. I was 13. So it's not like I was, I was like totally green to it, but in terms of like, you know, professionally and whatnot, I was pretty green. And it, it was, it, it was like, I got, I think I, I got like Anthony Rosenthal who had been in falsettos. And then it, it just, it was like the roads were paved with gold. And like, it was like, yes, from every agent and manager, and I had all these super amazing, incredible kids doing this musical about Scientology. And it was so fun. It was, it was really great. And I, it, it's weird because the new kid was a big part of my life, but um, I just hadn't thought about it really in, in a while by the time I had done it. And it occurred to me that I was like, it really is rare that like there's, shows are on like a professional level like with all kids like it's common for like annie or school of rock or matilda or even that show the people garden has an adult in it but like those are shows where there's kids but there's also adults so um which from a directing producing perspective is way less nightmarish because if you have limited time with kids you can do so for the adults but it's super rare that there are shows with all kids on a professional level. The only other one I can think of is really Rosie, um, which which also I, I I did go to really Rosie at Encores that year, and I did scout kids at that production. And Anthony Risenthal and um, Nicole Wildly Wildy Wildly I think it's Wildly um, who were in that production ended up being in Very Merry. Um, that was a really fun show at Encores. Do you know really Rosie? I don't. Oh, it's it's Carol King, Maurice Sendak, super bizarre. Um, I wow. won't I won't take up too much time talking about it, but it's a show I really love and would love to direct. Um, and yeah, we did it. I'm gonna pause you there before you go on. Yeah. we're we're getting short on time. So um, let's fast forward. Yeah. To you're doing an MFA at Brooklyn LAU in writing and producing for television. Yeah. And then how does how does the film live or the idea for a film live um, very merry come with that program? Yeah. So. Um, well, okay, so unfortunately, I do have to wrap up talking about 54 Below because it does play into it. So we did a 54 okay. Below. We were in the spot right after Christmas, which is like a garbage slot. And we we almost sold out, but we didn't quite sell out. But the reception was so good, and the kids were all really good. And I was I knew I had this good thing going. And I, I was like, I can't lose sight of this. And we ended up doing it a year later at Green Room 42. And it was hard because there was I had even less money and less time to do it. And it was actually really stressful doing it at Green Room 42. I had a new music director. And um, I found out that the she music that was licensed versus what we had was actually really different. And then my old music director had taken a lot of liberties with with the score that I didn't actually I wasn't aware that he did because they can't read music. Um, so it was a little trial by fire doing it at Green Room Forty Two, um, which this will come up later when I talk about doing doing the film version because we had to reorchestrate the entire thing, like when when. Um, it airs the way that the show sounds has never been heard the way that we've done it. Like the, from my understanding, Kyle the, has had sheet music for guitar and drums for the show. And then he like, it got wiped off his computer in a, in a like computer crash. And, and like, he told me that there was a production in Boston um, that made their own orchestrations for it. Um, but like any other time it's done with a three piece band, I think literally every single time people make up their own orchestrations, which is really wow. wild, isn't it? It's, it's yes. really kind of, <laughs> kind of insane, but so it's, it's not, not to say that the show has never been done with a three piece band cause it has, but, but our specific orchestrations, like, the the original cast album sounds almost like futuristic techno, whereas ours sounds very like pop rock musical theater. 
and in a way that just hasn't been heard on a scale like that before. But anyway, I did a Green 42, and um, to make an extremely long story short, I worked with the mom of one of the kids in that production, and she was a very wealthy woman who owned her own dance studio, and she wanted to choreograph and produce it. And um, her son was in the ensemble of the show, and it is a very ensemble show. There's, like, four roles that are more featured and they like have like solos, but, but everyone gets something. And, um, and the kid uh, who, who was in this particular track, I felt that he was perfect where he was because he was cute, but he just didn't have the strongest voice. And anyway, his mother um, really, it, it, to me, again, to make a really long story short, it, it turns out that she really wanted her kid to be famous. And um, she she kind of twisted my arm and, and forced me to cast him as, as the angel. And this would have been the New Jersey premiere in 2019. And um, she made the kid audition in front of us, and he was really nervous. And I was so worried about his ability to vocally handle it. And I was working with, so the show is usually done again with tracks and I was, and it usually is this more techno sound and, uh, and my sound designer was making tracks and we needed some of the piano parts to be played by, um, the kid's voice teacher. Um, and because he was like the most affordable option at the time. And I went to this voice teacher of this kid who was playing the angel and I was like, hey, I'm, like, really worried about this kid's ability to handle this score. And as we've seen with the whole Beanie Feldstein situation with, with Funny Girl, it really doesn't, especially when it comes to singing, that's really something you can't fake. Like, if you're just not strong at it, you're not strong at it. And that's okay, you know? Um, everyone's got their strengths. But um, it, it, it made me really nervous. And this voice teacher kind of... I don't I don't really know why he did what he did but he he did feel a certain type of way about me bringing it up and then I don't know what he said to this kid's mom and I'm not using names so hopefully this is not too confusing but basically um the kid's mom again the choreographer producer um, I think she felt like I was like bad mouthing her kid or something. I don't really know, but, but she pulled the plug on the whole thing. And it was really, um, shitty because, uh, we had put money down, uh, like to do it in Jersey city and all the wheels were in motion. And then, um, she, she pulled the plug on it and I had to call the theater and I was like, Hey, we can't do this. And they were like, okay, well we reserved this time for you and like all this stuff and if you don't pay us because that was the thing actually is that i paid for the rights and this woman was gonna pay for the deposit and i found out that she never paid the deposit even though she told me she did so this theater actually tried to sue us um and it was really scary and i was 26 years old and i remember just feeling I was like I lost this show that I cared so much about and by the way doing it in New Jersey was going to be really challenging because um I couldn't afford to do it on a union scale like I, it had to be non-union so that was already a huge concession was that I was I lost a lot of my kids um that I had done it with at Green Room and 54 respectively um but then you know it fell through and I almost got sued, and it was really terrible and awful. And um, uh, I I left New York. I was like, I don't want to be here anymore. Seriously, I love this show so much, and I worked so hard on it. And you have to keep in mind, too, that Alex Timbers and Kyle Jarrah were 24 when they won the OV Award for this show. They were some of the youngest OV Award winners in history, and this show really, like, kind of made their careers in a lot of ways. And I, I had no reason to feel like the show wouldn't do the same for me. So um, anyway, I was really down in my luck. I moved to Philadelphia and I did some soul searching. And I was like, what do I want to do with my life if it's not this? Because that's all I've, no I've ever known. And I just had this huge heartbreak and I just was feeling so uncertain and lost. And Kyle um, has kind of acted like a mentor to me in so many ways. And he writes for Star Trek as uh, out of many TV shows, but that's the main one he works for writes for Star Trek discovery. And I just felt like 
I went to Ithaca, which is a really good TV film school. I always regretted not double majoring in screenwriting. And I thought to myself, what if I went into TV? That would be cool. And then I was like, wait, I'm in Philadelphia. What do I do now? And then COVID happened. And um, I was in a bad living situation and I peaced out and I made my way back to New York. Um, And then I decided to apply for grad school. Um, to go to for writing and producing for television, and I applied all over the place. I actually applied to a lot of places in Canada because I thought Trump was going to win, and I didn't want to be here. Um, and to make a long story short, I got into LIU Brooklyn. I had a great conversation with Ken Lozevnik, who runs the program, um, who's a playwright. And I actually, when I was interviewing to him, I kind of put very merry behind me, and I was kind of like, I'll get to it if I get to it. And I had this idea to do a, um, like a virtual, well, it would have been similar to the NBC live format, but originally I I didn't want to have an audience and a live audience to do it. But originally I wanted to do Donnie Darko actually, which has been done as a play before at Harvard ART. And no one knows that. And it looked like it was going to happen. And it was going to be like this collaboration with the TV department and the undergrad actors and the theater department at LIU Brooklyn and then they lost a bunch of money, like with COVID. And there's, I have no problem saying it. There's a lot of problems with the administration of my school and just the way things are run. Um, and it just, the acting program dropped the project. But Ken still believed in me and was like, you can do, you know, whatever you want. He gave me like a really small amount of money. And I just was like, I feel like this, you know, I've lost access to the theater on campus and all these undergrad actors and it kind of feels like it doesn't matter what show that i do um because i'll have to use outside actors anyway so i was like i might as well just do this show i've been working on and like what what if i filmed it and what if i showed the whole world what i've what i've been working on for for all this time and that's and then i i took the some of the money ken gave me and i put down the deposit um, at the 14th Street Y, which is either an off-off or an off-Broadway house. And some people are like, the Y is an off-Broadway, but it is. You can go in the Lord's Hall archives and look it up. Um, And I was like, we're going to put down over 100 seats, and um, we're going to do it off-Broadway, and we're going to film it. And that's how we're going to do it. And I was like, I'm going to do it NBC Live style and... And it also, it was a really smart idea to do it that way because um, I knew that if I went through SAG um, on a micro-budget contract, it would cost me less money than doing, like, a digital theater production, like, and having to go through equity and paying rates that I couldn't afford. Um, And, yeah. As well as a filming fee. Yeah, exactly, exactly, which, you know, I mean, we don't have to get into all that, but it's... But it's certainly it, a lot of producers have been very challenged um, by by the way that you know equity sets that kind of thing up. So anyway, I, I actually am curious to ask: Did you try and explore the like doing it as a theater production and like see if you could do it that way, or did you just know that you should go by a SAG? Well, I knew from working with. Um, the mom of the kid, I'll call her Valerie, from working with Valerie like all those years ago, because we did try and get it off Broadway. And and basically what what ended up happening was is that the show what the rights are published and they weren't in the original production. The authors owned it. And it was all non equity. And I don't know how that happened because it was at New York Theater Workshop and no one has really explained to me like how that happened because it had been programmed as part of their season. Um, like it wasn't a rental or anything like that. Um, but basically if I wanted to go through equity, it would have been very expensive. And depending on how many hours I wanted to use with the kids, I would have, um, had to do tutoring and I would have had to maybe double cast it. Like it was just the, the balance of time and money and the rights, was really off it was it was like i feel like producers can work with one of those things but like not all of them and so that was really the reason why 
I I never gave it a run. And my my thinking was like, I was like, well, if I film it and people like it, maybe we can try and do it in reverse. Like maybe this, I can have this film version and then um, it takes off and, and people will want to give it a run, which I still hope will happen. Um, but if hey, it, there's plenty of precedent for that. And just it, today, actually, uh, 1660 Vine uh, just announced that they, it was, it's a movie musical that you can stream on Stellar or Broadway on demand. And now they've, uh, just, um, signed a deal with MTI to license it. Wow. So, performed you know very widely now i imagine because it's it's streaming and people will know what it is that's so I, that's awesome um yeah and so i just spent the last you know six months of my life doing this this t- tv version and it was it was nuts it was exciting um it was the hardest thing i've ever done in my life i mean seriously because I already was taking on a lot by directing and designing and, and producing it. Um, but it, it really, it was, to be quite honest, I was kind of um, out of my depth doing this show because um, it was just on such a bigger scale than anything I was used to doing as a director and as a producer. And musicals are hard on their own. And especially, you know, with the whole reorchestrating thing, like that was a challenge in and of itself. But then there was also kids. Um, and it was a really hard show to cast this round. Um, I don't know if it was because I didn't have Van Dien or what, but like no one wanted to do it. <laughs> and um, I just kind of was like, all right, I guess I'm just going to have to find more money. And that's, to be honest, still something that I'm talking with investors and working on and shameless plug. If you want to donate, you can at givebutter.com slash very merry live. But basically I, um, I was like, all right, I'm going to have to move money around and I'm going to have to like pay these kids more because really no one was going for it. And, um, as soon as I kind of made that happen and like took out credit cards and stuff that, I would not advise doing. Um, I got the most like amazing kids of all time. Um, and, and they were all, it, it was like doing it at 54, but like, but like better. Cause we were doing it full out. And, and when you're working with kids that are pros, like, like I was like, these kids are really smart and, um, and they're used to doing, um, like these, these big shows on tight turnarounds and, all that kind of stuff, which is really what I needed. And I had the most wonderful time. I am so honored that I got to work with these kids. Um, cause they were, they were all really, really great and, um, and smart and talented and funny. And I, I think also something about the show that I, I love a lot, but I think kids appreciate is, so my cast ranged from nine to 16, which is a really big range. Um, yeah. And uh, I think especially for the older kids, like they don't want to do shows that, that like are just Disney shows forever or like, like junior shows forever by the time you're 13, 14. Cause that's certainly how I felt. Like I remember being 16 years old. That's when I was in rent. One of my girls in very Mary was 16. Um, just now and and the older kids I think really really enjoy working with material that is that is like kind of smart quote unquote um yeah so yeah and that that says more than what it uh is like reading on the page there's like all this context around it and um like subtleties and satire that's happening in the script that is does not happen in in most kids theater no i and i think that's the beauty but also the curse of the show a little bit from a producing perspective is that it's like there's nothing in it so first of all kyle and alex so brilliantly in order to avoid being sued they literally used like documents from the church from Dianetics, and they just set it to music so that there wouldn't be anything um, that would be, like, libel. So, really, it uses satire using, like, their own words in a way that I think is so brilliant. And, um, and like, I, like I, I've always done a Scientology crash course with the kids because it's really important that they know what they're performing in. And, um, and I talk to them about, like, existentialism. 
<laughs> and stuff yeah. like that with like nine to sixteen year olds. And they got it. They like really did. And it's it's super fun having those conversations with kids because like sometimes kids will just like phrase things in the most simple way and you're like, Yeah, that's it, actually. You nailed it. <laughs> they get it. They really do. Um what was your camera setup? Um, I have three cameras set up, um, and I mostly followed my DP around, um, and I was, like, he was handheld, and we had two stationary cams, um, we taped the dress, um, and then, but we had a, a wardrobe malfunction, the angel had a halo that was made out of a, a coat hanger, and, and, um, and it, like, went totally awry and uh and like this this kid's halo was like hanging the back of his shirt and we actually the tech guy like the head of production wasn't there for our taping and he had wire clippers and we didn't have wire clippers and we just had to like do the dress rehearsal footage with this like kind of jank halo um because by the way the way that i staged it is i staged it that it it sat in a scientology prison um and all the kids are like in rags um and there's garbage everywhere and there's like a dumpster and i wanted it to feel like these kids were making um a pageant about scientology with the resources they had available to them in a scientology prison um (laughs) Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Um, hee <laughs> it's dark. Um, but which is not, you know, the show is written very ambiguously. Like it's, I, I think the original very much ha- it felt like it was like, are the parents of these children forcing them to do this in a Scientology church? Like it's always been a little, a little vague. So I, as, especially since this was a revival, um, and I really wanted to feel like my own, um, my own take on the material. That's kind of why I chose to go in that direction. And it was also cheaper. It was just also cheaper to, to make a set that didn't look good <laughs> and, and having the kids. And I also thought it was just funny. Cause like the NBC lives are like, so like lavish and like, you know, these, like, spectacle-driven things, and I have these kids in, like, you know, like, gray t-shirts with patches, and the whole thing is, like, so monochromatic, and there's, like, like, no huge spectacle value, and I thought that was kind of funny, um, because, like I said, you know, like, Annie, Grease, Hairspray, all these, well, they're, like, so big, and I was, like, yeah, this isn't a prison, <laughs> and I just thought that was funny. Of that. <laughs> yeah, and, and- an interesting like juxtaposition because Scientology is so over the top and so like gaudy is the word that comes to mind for me. And then to have this dank, dark prison. Yeah. Really cool about that. What was it like having the live audience come in and then filming with the live audience? Um, It was interesting. I, I remember like uh, there was a lot of conversation about, capturing the sound of the audience and i remember people were like um use use hanging mics use floor whatever and we actually for better or for worse we actually didn't end up miking the audience and i have to actually see how that sounds in post um mm-hmm. but one thing that i will say that i did not feel great about but just is something that happened is um i we did have uh, i think it was at our first taping we had a baby that was like kind of loud and we had to like ask some stuff out in the hallway because like film is like not forgiving like i mean it's there forever you know um so that that was probably the most challenging thing i would say like at a in terms of like hiccups or whatever because if it was a regular performance i would have let it be but um my basically the way that it worked was i was on headset i was with my dp there's these two stationary cameras and then whenever we would yell cut to reset something we did yell cut quite a bit um which i don't think is super common for how these tapings normally go but you also have to keep in mind i was under so like equity digital theater agreements versus like what what is a film versus digital theater are really strict and um i really wanted to do my due diligence to make sure that it really did feel feel like a film set um because 
Um, a lot of people expected us to live stream it, um, actually. And part of the reason why we didn't is because with SAG, they say that it's a film when something is substantially edited. So, and, and which ours is going to be. I, and I think probably in an ideal world, if I had a switchboard and all this, like, you know, crazy stuff, um, I, I, and I, I had people like a booth or whatever, like I would have been able to do it probably more how they actually do it. Um, but I have been told that some of the NBC lives are, are done live and then they take a day or two off to edit them and then they premiere it, which I know is the case for Fox live because they use the dress rehearsal footage. Cause that guy broke his leg. Yeah, it's meant to be, uh, I think those productions are live, but they have um, like footage just in case, like if something goes terribly awry, because those are like multi-million dollar projects, they have to have a backup and like, they, they can't have nothing to air on TV. So they, they have like backup footage, right. but it is done live. Um, I have a great interview with Kenneth Ferone, who is an associate producer on Fox, on uh, Rent on Fox. And it, he tells a really, the harrowing story behind what oh happened god. there <laughs> oh dear god yeah it sounds like a nightmare um but it, it was actually i have to say the kids were were really grateful actually for us being able to call cut because they learned the whole show in two weeks and the show's only an hour long um but i i really wanted to make sure that the kids like especially because it was such a hard show to sell agents and managers on like a base level. Um, but I also wanted to do it in such a way, even just financially, (laughs) if anything else, to make sure kids had time to like do their homework and be in school. Like I didn't, I only, I only did it after school and during the week I was in rehearsals from five to seven. And then we had a few hours on the weekends. So we were learning it really, really fast. And, and by the time that we got to our dress rehearsal, like the time that we act, that we actually filmed the dress, that was like pretty much their second time doing it like, like a full run. Um, so I think, I think they were grateful for the opportunity if like they forgot a line or, you know, there was like sound issues or whatever. And and we yelled cut for a multitude of reasons. Sometimes it was a line thing. Sometimes it was a blocking thing. Sometimes it was a camera thing. Um, but, but we, I, I did tell the kids, I was like, you know, we have this, this safety net, you know, so if you like forget your line or whatever, we can feed it to you and reset. And I think that was really um, reassuring for them to have what's the editing process going to look like and when can we expect to see it? That is the question of the hour because, (laughs) um, so I'm going to see a rough cut this weekend. Um, and the plan is to release it on Thanksgiving. Um, however, (laughs) I know it, it is really soon. Um, however, I need to really, see how the sound mixing goes because sound mixing live is really hard um and i know my distributor um jay cruz at ift network um he really he's been so great um and he really wants us to have a product we're really proud of so um I think if anything I've learned in, in my career, it's that good things, you know, take time. I mean, very Mary took five years to, to do off Broadway. So I think we're in that same vein. I'm not rushing the editing process either. So I, but what I do know is that I want the release to be on a holiday. So if it gets pushed back from Thanksgiving, we'll probably air it on Christmas Eve, I think is my, my backup. Um, and I, I feel like for the purposes of, of doing a podcast and press, I should probably be more secure in that date, but post-production for a grad school student project that's of this scale is really difficult. And, um, I, so in the holiday season, um, but if everyone follows unattended baggage, my company on Instagram or Facebook, it's unattended underscore baggage underscore, co co um and we're also on twitter unattended underscore bag um and just keep an eye out for updates and at the earliest it'll be thanksgiving at the latest it'll be christmas eve um so very excited fingers crossed yeah i i can't wait to see it i it it sounds fascinating and i um 
knowing the show previously and and how um how different it is i'm i'm really excited to see your production so we have my our final segment which is called my favorite things where i ask my favorite questions these are a few of my favorite things uh, you don't need to think about it too much whatever comes to mind is good there are no wrong answers cool first up what is your favorite musical pippin hmm why pippin um i did that show when i was like 14 years old and i remember thinking it was a really smart musical like i remember because it's like very meta and i i remember being like i've never been in a musical like this before and i love i love how dark it is and i love how um you know bob fossey i think in a lot of ways like it's his love hate letter to musical theater because it's like he loves it but then also i think he he really hints at how dark the industry can be in this idea of if you're not, if you're not a star, you're not special. Um, Cause I, I think that's, that's really, you know, cause at the end of the show, Pippin is like, um, I, like he realizes the, the importance of the relationship of him and Catherine and, and just leading a life that fulfills him without um, all this like glamor and magic shows and miracles as they say. And, um, and I, I just think it's, it's really kind of profound and had an impact on me um, when I was in it as a teenager. Um, it, it just really made me think about musicals in a way that I never have. Cause I think that ending in particular, it's like that grand finale and then he doesn't do it. It's like kind of like the anti-musical theater in a lot of ways, which I think is so cool. Yeah. Do you have a favorite filmed live musical? That's a good question. Do I? I would probably say, and it, it's it's still not perfect, but probably Rocky. Probably the pro shot of Rocky Horror that's out there is is pretty good. Um, all in all, Rocky Horror is like my second favorite musical. So, um, <laughs> but I, I I like how um that production is like really retro looking in a lot of ways um, and and almost feels more in the vein of, of the original production in that, in that sense. Um, and I just think it's, it's pretty seamless about one. I think, I don't know. I'm biased. I love Rocky. It's sad because it had like one of the lowest ratings of all those. I know. I know. TV musicals. <laughs> but you can't win a them film all. Live musical, <laughs> a film live musical isn't exactly a stage show, but it's not exactly a film. So what should we call it? Well, I think they're TV specials. I mean, I think each one is done a little differently from what it seems. Like, one of my girls in Very Merry was talking to me about Annie Live and how that worked. And Annie Live, I think, like, she was saying that they use footage from the dress rehearsal and they also did it live. And But, like, how do I explain this? I think that, like... A roughly half or a quarter of what was aired was actually from a different taping. And then they like uh, somehow through magic that I don't understand um, went to switching to them doing it live. Does that like make sense? Like they, they were doing two things at once there pretty much. Um, and I think, I think it's TV. I mean, at the end of the, some of them are, are made for film, but I do think, especially in very Mary's case, because we yelled cut, we reset. Um, and we, we had the opportunity to kind of make polishes as we did it. It really felt more, more in the spirit of film to me, but I think others of them, um, are really just plays with cameras in them, uh, depending on, on how they're done, you know? Um, but uh, but at least according to SAG and Equity, what I did was a TV special. So for <laughs> my purposes, that's what it is. But it does exist in a weird realm. You're completely right. Yeah. Where do you stand on bootlegs? Mm, you're going to get me into trouble. You know what? I'm just going to say it. I don't have a problem with bootlegs. I understand why, the argument that like actors don't give consent to be in them. And I understand that, you know, it like 
takes money away from from authors. But I, to be honest, only think that bootlegs help shows I, I and the reason i say that is because i think there are so many shows that have huge international fan bases that don't otherwise get to see them and you know as we, we kind of touched on like the whole mechanics of of filming a stage play through through equity is like really really expensive and like more expensive than cast albums which are pretty expensive um but it's it's like i think just learning from doing very merry which is you know, a TV project, like once you add a film crew, it's just, it's really expensive. So basically I think the bootlegs are a great way for people to get to know shows who would otherwise not be able to see them and who probably would pay for them if they live closer, but like, but like don't. And I also think bootlegs are really important for preserving shows that maybe don't do so well. Like I only knew about a stat because of bootlegs. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and so many, there's so many other shows that I, I love um, from, you know, like the 70s and whatever that um, – because I love flops. I really do. And I and I wouldn't know them if, if there weren't for, for bootleg. Shout out to Aurora Spider-Woman on YouTube. I love them. They are a <laughs> treasure trope of, like, the coolest bootlegs. Um, anyway, so, yeah, I'm pro bootleg. But, you know, don't cancel me uh, for saying no, that. I think I think that's a really uh, – interesting and good perspective because you're totally right and something that surprised me as I've been doing film live musicals is like discovering this entire ecosystem (laughs) that is like under the ground of of bootlegs and it's this whole world that is like that I wish that uh the like mainstream would embrace because it's all people who love 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 theater and they will pay money to to watch pro shots yeah you'll always have like someone who's not going to pay and wants to you know get it for free but we're talking about students and people that love theater that's so yeah i totally i kind of agree with you it's an access thing it it really is and accessibility is the most important thing to me which speaking of very merry will be free to stream so that's cool that's awesome uh what stage musicals do you wish had been filmed like like pro shot wise. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say I I do want to do a set as as an NBC live special. I have this like like fantasy of of doing it like all out and like having like some sort of rocker playing with sat. And actually this is a crackhead idea, but I would love to see Miley Cyrus play with sat. I actually think she <laughs> would, she would totally rock it. Um, but uh, I think that's, that's one of them. I would love you in town to get the NBC live treatment. Um, I'm trying to think, what other musicals do I love? I love It's a Bird, It's a Plane, It's Superman, which has, it, it's it, it gotten its own version, but it was a long time ago. Um, and it, it's almost, I don't know how to describe it. Because, like, the camera is pretty stationary. I don't think there's even an audience. Um, I don't think we have a very good... We There is some musical numbers that were filmed for a TV special in the 70s of Godspell, but we don't have um, a really good pro shot of Godspell, to my knowledge. Do we? I don't know. I, uh, yeah, I don't think I've come across one. Yeah, those are, are the ones that's going to mind. It is kind of bizarre that Little Shop hasn't gotten that treatment, I have to say. Yes, I, I'm very sad that the, the off-Broadway production that's currently running is unlikely to get a pro show. I know, I know. Those are the ones that come on the top of my head, yeah. Oh, and Shock Treatment. Oh, my God, I would love to see the stage version of Shock Treatment done live. But <laughs> apparently Richard O'Brien doesn't want it to happen again, but I would love for it to happen. Uh, what stage musicals would you like to see? We'll kind of answer this, but what would you like to see filmed in the future? Um, yeah, I mean, I think all the all the ones I just listed, pretty much. Yeah, wonderful. And where can we find you online? Um, yeah, so unattended underscore baggage underscore co on uh, Instagram. Our website is unattendedbaggagecompany.com. dot com, and our Twitter is under unattended underscore bag. And if you want to find me personally, uh, my Instagram is <clears throat> Sean P underscore 
yo. And and screw it, you can look me up on Twitter. I'm a little I, I'm a little weird about Twitter. I like to ke- kind of keep a lower profile on there, but my handle is um at I'm a swamp witch. So <laughs> Yeah, I will have links to all of those in the show notes. Sean, thank you so much for your time today. I cannot wait for a very merry to come out. Thank you. Thank you so much. The Filmed Live Musicals podcast is created and edited by our host, Louisa Lyons. With thanks to our wonderful patrons, Josh Brandon, Geraldine Brewer, Belinda Broido, Elliot Charles, Rachel Esteban, Mercedes Esteban Lyons, Luke Hasselman, David Jones, James T. Lane, Heather Madrone, Wendy Marcotte, Alison Matthews, Al Monaco, David Negrin, Amy Penn, Gerald Piper, Jesse Rabinowitz and Brenda Goodman, David and Catherine Rabinowitz, Joe Tillotson, Beck Twist and Tyson Van Helsing for financially supporting the site. Filmlivemusicals.com is the most comprehensive list of film stage musicals. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you would like early access to this very podcast, early access to site content, the full weekly newsletter with info on upcoming streams, and exclusive access to the streaming calendar, become a Filmed Live Musicals patron for as little as $3 a month. Visit filmedlivemusicals.com to learn more. If you like what you hear, please leave a review on Apple Music. It really helps get the word out about the show. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and thanks for listening.